of statistics that you guys got to go through here. Um, we've been looking at them for years. Um, like the, the fire officials know that we're not the bad guys here. We've been uh, building better homes. Uh, I've been doing it for over 30 years now. Um, they're, they're, uh, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions and some of the facts that are left out of some of these reports that are coming through. Um, age of homes does have a lot to do with um, fire deaths in the area. We have had studies done and they're available to blue. Um, I build most of my homes outside of the municipal water supply areas. Most of them are uh, much larger uh, than the standard two and three thousand square foot homes. Uh, we build a lot in the Adirondacks. I have, uh, I have suggested sprinklers and uh, fire protection spray on system to all of my home builders, uh, home, homeowners, and have not been able to sell either to any of them. One of the big uh, issues and concerns that I have is that uh, probably over the last 10 or 15 years, I have seen absolutely no education uh, towards the general public in regards to fire safety. Uh, no public service commission uh, uh, commercials, nothing in the nothing in the news, nothing on the, in the in the uh, newspapers. Um, it it seems that what we're doing uh, or trying to do is push through a, uh, a code that, again, we're not saying isn't a good system, but it seems that we're not <coughs> attempting to uh, stop the initial issue, uh, which mostly is. Uh, consumer uh, causes of, of fires. Um, so I would, I would really, uh, we are, um, I, I personally would, would much rather see uh, these, uh, this education go out to the public um, instead of forcing another mandated uh, code on, on the public in, in the housing. Thank you. I understand we have a speaker in the Buffalo office. Um, name is Todd Verwernt, the West Independent Living Incorporated. Is that correct? I am here. Okay. Could, just, could you no, 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 I just need the camera. <laughs> I think it's electronic. I think it moves electronically, maybe. Hold on. <coughs> we see you now. There you go. Okay. Can you see me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> My apologies for being late. Uh, I'll break from the discussion about fire sprinklers just briefly. Uh, my name is Todd Barrick. I'm with Western American Independent Living for the Independent Living Center. We're having a little trouble hearing you. If you please. can slow down a bit and speak up, please. Okay. Uh, the mics are where? Great. Okay. Thank you. Much better. Better now? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your thank you for your patience. My name is Todd Varwerk, V as in Victor, A A R W E R K. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Public <laughs> Policy for Western New York Independent Living. We're the independent living center that serves Erie, Niagara, Genesee, Wyoming, and Orleans counties. I'm here to talk just briefly about the proposal from Disability Rights New York um, that we add fire extinguishers to alarm systems in commercial buildings. As a person with a disability,
is Ann Marie Mitchell, and I'm a builder in upstate New York, and I have no intention of speaking, so I'm going to be very brief and just address a couple of things in response. I want to be clear that when the sprinkler advocates are talking about price per square foot, they're talking about price per square foot of sprinkled area, not living space. So even in the habitat humanity that mentioned earlier, the 1,200 square foot house cost $4,800, so that's $4 a square foot. So there's a very big difference between square footage that you know when you're going to buy a house as opposed to square footage that they're using for sprinkler calculation. Also, if there's PEX tubing in the basement, you absolutely have to sheetrock it and fire block it to protect any time there's PEX tubing, it cannot be exposed to a basement. So that does increase the costs. Um, on wells, the significant cost of it's just significant. And if you have poor water, quality with the well, you also have to be concerned about the water quality of it getting in the sprinkler because you cannot have poor water quality. You put a water purification system onto it, it reduces the flow, you've got additional issues. So depending on the water, it really does make a huge impact. Um, I was also a member of the sprinkler task group as a builder representative and one of the things that I did, I do timber frame homes which is a specific different type of construction. I actually submitted to the group two plans of houses that we were in the process of constructing. Ask them to please A, quote it and B, explain how we can do this and not have exposed pipes throughout the house. I was then told that because such a small pocket, small amount of homes are built as timber frames, that that cannot be considered as part of the formula. So just so I did not get a response. I am for sprinklers. I am for all that. I'm just not for the mandate. I think what Lake Placid has done with great success is a voluntary program. Is a, I mean that is absolutely the way we should be going. Is it a voluntary program, not a mandate? Thank you. Do we have any other um, speakers uh, that would like to uh, address the co council? Thank you. Agenda item number four report of the residential code. Technical subcommittee. Uh, we're going to hear this report, then I believe we'll take a, uh, a short uh, break, and then we'll uh, continue with the, uh, with the proceedings. Uh, my understanding, Mark, uh, Miriam MacGyver is going to be presenting the report. Miriam is uh, at our Buffalo location, correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay, Mark, would you like to introduce uh, the item and then uh, and then introduce Miriam? To the. Um the Code Council has heard the reports of the technical subcommittees of, of prior to this meeting of all the, um, uh, the codes uh, with the exception of the Residential Code Technical Subcommittee. And today we have Miriam MacGyver um, giving that report uh, from our Buffalo location. Uh, Miriam, are you there? Are you there? Yes, I am. And um, I had prepared a memo to the code council members describing the the um, residential technical subcommittee's recommendation and I'd like to just briefly go over that memo without going over all the details in it. Um, we the, the technical subcommittee uh, met six times. It was a great subcommittee with a really good range of technical knowledge and experience. Uh, we in the first four meetings went through the chart which is on the website. It shows the um, changes to New York State's residential code, current, the 2010 residential code um, with, as you go to the 2012 IRC. The technical subcommittee in the, um, in the second to last meeting, the chair, Judy Weiser, asked committee members if they had significant issues, you know, if there were items in the rest of the chart that they to bring up at the last meeting. Because it was quickly, sorry, 
we wouldn't be able to make it. Miriam, you have to speak up a little bit. Uh, okay, sorry. So at the second to the last meeting, the, the chair, Julie nemeth -Weiser, asked the members of the technical subcommittee to bring up any issues of specific concern. We went over some of them in the last meeting. And we continued through the chart to um, item 435. The uh, technical, some of the technical subcommittees Members also sent us their recommendations for the remaining items on the chart. And I, um, then the staff, which is, you know, was uh, people in the office, Julie and me and a couple other people, put in comments on the remainder of the items. Most of them were um, continuation of New York State modifications, things that were, or things mandated by New York State law or basic clarifications where, where IRC had clarified by reorganizing. They may have looked more, more major than they were when we got down to them. Um, a couple of the things that uh, the changes of note are, we added a definition of live work units to the residential code. So that would allow structures to be built as new construction under the residential code where there's um, an intention to conduct work out of the structure. Um, <coughs> the, right now, you can build a structure as a residence and someone may, using Appendix J, have a change in use and have a home occupation, but there is nothing in the new construction portion of the IRC that allows you to construct a one or two family residence that would have a business use in it. Um, the, uh, there are requirements, a home that will have a business use, I mean, there's kind of a carrot. You would need to have a residential fire suppression sprinkler, among other things. Um, and it, when you, uh, when you heard, I'm just going to jump back. When you heard John Adario, who's the chair of the Plumbing, Mechanical, and Fuel Gas Code Technical Subcommittee, I believe their their technical subcommittee recommended inclusion of the IRC uh, requirements. Their their you know basically their technical specs for a residential sprinkler system. It's a little more affordable and a more of a cookie cutter system. So that's in chapter 29 of the IRC 2012 edition. Um, and we in the technical subcommittee recommended allowing that within the live work units. Uh, there is language also that says uh, live, um, Live work units complying with requirements of section 419 of the International Building Code shall be, be shall be permitted to be built as one and two family dwellings or townhouses. Fire suppression required by 419 of the International Building Code when constructed under the International Residential Code for one and two family dwellings shall conform to section 2904. That's what that section 2904 is. Um, I should point out that the International Building Code would would require them to be built to um, chapter, or sorry, to NFPA 13. NFPA 13. 13. Um, the second issue is that um, under planning, all homes will now would need. Mechanical ventilation, whole house ventilation was now required for all new residences. Um, that was pre presented to you during previous discussions because it, due to changes in the, in the energy code and in the uh, mechanical um, section of the residential code, uh, homes will now be sealed so, you know, tightly enough so that mechanical ventilation is required. Another change is the wind, wind design speed has changed and the wind borne debris region has changed. And it's a, that will have a big effect in Long Island in that now all of the state is shown as having um, a design speed of less than 110 miles per hour. What that means is that you can use the prescriptive provisions in the residential code 
instead of having to use um, special design standards in parts of Long Island. Um, there's also language, again, a, a carrot to promote using fire suppression sprinklers. The um, Section 302 allows in cases where you have sprinklers, your firewalls um, will be reduced from two hours in unsprinklered townhouses to a one-hour wall. I think Julius mentioned that as well in his discussion. Um, the braced wall section, another structural change, the braced wall section has been very much simplified and it, it, it allows some new technology like structural insulated panel and I, I think the major benefit is it is much clearer and more more understandable. It does allow, um, it has some added requirements for brace, you know, for uplift of braced walls, for fastening your braced walls, but mostly what it does is make it clearer and provide more options. Um, uh, one of the big changes is part of a modification that the Code Council has already considered. Um, part 8, which is the residential section of, of, uh, of the residential code, would be largely replaced with reference to NEC, the National Electric Code. It would allow us to refer to the, the most recent version, the 2014 version, and it would make it simpler to update when NEC is updated. I, I know the Code Council has heard a lot of people talk about how, how important it is to keep current in the, in the, uh, with the National Electric Code reference, um, and it is what the industry does. Um, we would keep New Yorkisms. <clears throat> there are some modifications we have that we would keep. Um, the recommended revisions to Appendix D, uh, we've, we've asked that we refer to a federal standard rather than um, it's a standard used by HUD, so we'd be more in line with practices in the, in the rest of the country and federal standards. Um, other than that, um, we did the, the technical subcommittee did reject a, a few changes. One fairly big change, we rejected section 404, um, which provides new cables for concrete reinforcement, and it um, essentially removed the option for un unreinforced concrete. The technical subcommittee opposed this based on uh, one of our members uh, had a really, uh, you know, had with a lot of knowledge and experience in concrete construction said this was an unnecessary and unjustified increase in cost. Um, it is a big change from IRC. Um, we, the IRC had a, added a definition of habitable attics. Again, it was kind of a carrot to sprinklers. You could have a habitable attic um, with a sprinkler system. However, by adding this habitable attic, you would have kind of unlimited area. You could end up with a five-story, basically a five stories of habitable space in, in a, being built under the residential code, and, and the committee felt that was too risky. Um, we also uh, rejected something that's basically a, a kind of construction in New York State often includes a basement with an uninhabited basement where things like your furnace or boiler or um, you know your electrical entrance are and what IRC has added a requirement that would require sheet wrapping all basement ceilings so we rejected that because it does not conform to typical construction practices in New York State. And that's, uh, that's it for my presentation on these changes. There are pages of changes at, in the attached chart. Are there any questions? Let's uh, let's see if uh, council has any questions for Miriam on her report and the the uh, the chart that's been presented to you on the uh, residential code. Any questions from members of the council? Okay. Buffalo, New York, no, no questions. Okay. Uh, we're not going to, we're not going to be taking action on that report at this time. 
that that becomes part of the of the uh, the general update uh, uh, for uh, for the code in its entirety. So, if there are no questions, uh, we're going to take a uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break, and then we'll come back on the record at 12:15, uh, and we will continue with the meeting.
Well, he's good at that. Yes, I do. It's up here. Tribute to that kids that went to the Olympics. I know, it might fall apart. My God, really? Seventeen little kids. Yeah. 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 I'm still up in Albany for a while, yeah. Um, no, there's a second one. Give me a favor. Just a minor Just a or what else can you say? Well, I can't imagine. So where is that? Oh, oh, where I am now. Yeah. 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 Supposedly he already did all the work. Uh, yeah, I don't know. One way or the other. Additional energy talks. Okay. Oh, yeah. I know. And that's the other one. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where is that? Oh, so they sold it. Yeah, Okay. I know. There's a, so you, and you, then you're in that interesting mechanical that you have to spring. Just look at where the frame is. Oh, and you have to take this first thing before. I mean, in commercial, we don't get away with that. I always tell you that. There's an exemption for heavy tips. But not in front of you. I said it. I heard it. No No stone plate glass next week. No what? No stone plate glass next week. Yeah, but is it supposed to keep you warm? Are you getting more today? No. It's just cold. It's getting today. You heard my joke when I got here. I said, it's so cold this morning, and it's like, oh, God. Uh, no, so, so next like, week I should bring my wool. It's like you have to do the short program to get to your car. <laughs> Everything is frozen. Like, you're skating. That's right. How are you doing, you, Jim? Yeah. 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 Yeah, all sounds good. Yeah, I've got it. 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 Yeah, I've got it
Since that time, right. actually, the last time I had a meeting in, in yeah. no, not the time before, I had a meeting in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. I flew into Rhode Island. Yeah, TF Green, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, every time I'm stuck in New England, I have to fly out. Uh, either if I'm, if I'm on the north side of Boston, I make reservations out of Manchester. If I'm on the south side of Boston, I go to TF Green. Yeah, the meeting was on the south side of Boston. Like, screw it. Yeah. Killing yourself in traffic to get yeah. Logan versus just, okay, it's long years ago. Yeah. I'm trying to stand it still. Yeah. 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 Over past the yeah, to get yeah, the <laughs> It's like, where the heck are we going? Yeah. When American pulled out of all the and the second time I was routed through the night. And I at night, and we're already late, coming in, a whole bunch of us on that flight. They land us like in gate 82, and the Albany flight's out of the way. We've got 10 minutes to make it, and we're still on the plane. And then that's the end of that. Back to United. He's going to bite the expense to fly United again. Yes. Yeah. I got a million miles. Oh, hold on. So we got to yeah. stick with more. Too many perks. That's right. I guess it's about America. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jake's got 40,000 miles over there. They're just going to disappear, I think. So. Mm -hmm. Got to get a line of bodies. Yeah. My fun one, you're talking about the new car park. I get this call in the state. 
This is Thursday, and it's a delicate word for you. It's a crisis. It's only Thursday. We need you in Willow on Monday morning. Okay. My first thought is, where the heck is it? What ocean is that? I'm going. You know, and my wife is watching me from her office. I'm trying to make this bunch of little that. She's like, hey, cool. It's for his only chance. Is it? Yeah. And I just can't. Yeah. 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 Because you can't plot unless you take it. Right. So I was like, no, we'll take the one and see what you can do. So I'm like, my travel agent at the time, you know, because he's a lot of I'm not going to do this. Oh, excuse me. You do this. Yeah, that's all. This is his name. Jew. I'm so just So she said to me, I'm later. I'm up to probably E something K. Leaving from K at the very end. And I've got 35 minutes to make this flight. And mine comes in one. I ran the whole way. I don't worry about it. There's a few people behind you. I'm saving grace when you're not the last one. Yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of my flights seem to go to the So it's not too bad. It's always in separate terminals. Yeah. Coming out of Albany. Yeah, you either going A or C. And you should be acting as But I will actually, a lot of times, schedule my flights. So I've got plenty of time to well, the wild thing is, it used to be until the merger. Every we went out as Now, half go out of A, half go out of C, and how did you get to the end? Where am I going now? And I got to the one that was the one that was sick. I got there in time to stay on the flight. And I go and check it. I said, can I get you one of those? She goes, I'm not going to do that. No, you can't. Yes. Hey, you can't do that. I did that. I've done that a couple of times. So, uh, it's kind of and some have given me cards. Some of the spells I don't know, like, you know, I'll show you what I have. Interior is Trump. Do you see how many of them are going to get some copies? Get somebody to get some Show us the book. And you go for it. Go do it. She said, no, no. If I gave you the money, you still said no, right? Okay. Cool. Wait, you got blue flag. The whole thing. Yeah. 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 I know it's on. I Oh, you I thought you said disappointed. Like, oh, you put out that Where is that? Yeah, 
They go down to watch lunch. They do. Mayor Kennedy's producing eating nuts. I go for days on Don't forget the cigarettes at the Hershey bar. They were really good where is it? Mike? Make that.
All right, if I can have your attention, everyone, uh, we're going to continue with the meeting. We'll, uh, we'll go back on the record. Agenda item number five, Uniform Code Building Resilience Initiatives. Before I uh, ask Mark and Miriam to uh, present the uh, agenda item to you, uh, as, as you all know, uh, we have been uh, inflicted by some extreme weather events that have really changed uh, not only the face of New York, but the, but the, the thinking of, of people in Albany and around the state about uh, just how these events have, have impacted us, how future events would uh, impact us, and, uh, and, and what we need to do as a, as a state to uh, be better prepared for the next event, God forbid. No one, no one wants it to come, but we all, I think, are starting to, to think that it's inevitable that these events are not going away. So since, uh, in particular, Superstorm Sandy, uh, we have received some information from FEMA at the national level. Uh, we've also uh, seen our colleagues in the city of New York uh, addressing building resilience and changes that they have proposed to the New York City Building Code. Uh, and in addition, <coughs> Governor Cuomo established three commissions following uh, Hurricane Sandy to study the impact of, uh, of that event on our state uh, and to help us to understand better how we might be able to prepare better for the next, for the future. And so from those, from those three bodies of information, uh, we have developed some potential recommendations for you to consider at some point regarding how our state code uh, could be amended or improved to address building resilience in a, in a more comprehensive way. And so with that introduction, I'll ask uh, Mark to continue. Well, I was going to say some of that as well, but I'll just okay. move forward. And um, the uh, Miriam Guyver uh, at the Buffalo location uh, we'll, reporting, uh, we'll be reporting on some of the building resilience initiatives that we're looking at. Miriam? Okay. Oh, let me know if I'm not loud enough. I have the speaker right in front of me, so this should work. Well, as, uh, as Ron and Mark said, we've had a lot of severe weather events. The Sandy, Irene, and Lee um, resulted in different entities making proposals on how to make building code, change the building codes to improve the resiliency of both the built environment uh, and the communities um, that are using the buildings. We looked at proposals from FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We also looked at New York City had taken a series of actions in order to um, 
improve the building resiliency and also to make it possible for people to partially occupy or you know kind of subsist in the buildings without uh, as much difficulty. Some of the things you may have heard in the news people had were not able to get to potable water. They weren't able to, you know, there was big pileups of garbage on the 20th floor of apartment buildings. So New York City made changes um, to make it possible for people who couldn't get out of those areas to have a, a you know, if not a, a, what we would call a, a you know, completely livable environment, at least be able to subsist until things were were made better. Um, there were also some other um, agencies in in New York State and people within the Department of State um, who had some other suggestions. So we looked through the proposals from FEMA, the actions from New York City, and listened to people in New York State and, and came up with with some proposals that we think will, would enhance um, resiliency throughout New York State. Um, so the, we recommended seven changes, amendments to the Uniform Code. And the first is within the Residential Code of New York State. In Section 324, it discusses high hazard um, flood areas, coastal high hazard areas, which are the V zones, if you're familiar with the National Flood Insurance map descriptions. Um, what FEMA had proposed, well, I'm, first I'll discuss the three FEMA proposals that we recommend and then um, move on to the actions by New York City. So this was, FEMA had proposed this and I, the Code Council has their proposal which describes um, the, the language that FEMA wants to, specifically what, how they want to change the language and their justification for it. Um, what they would like to do is is add reference to a standard, a reference standard for flood resistant design and construction to the residential code. That standard is developed by the American Society for Civil Engineers. It's called ASCE 24. And it's Sorry, designed ASCE 24. ASCE 24. ASCE 24. It's developed, it's a, it's a fairly short standard. It's developed in a consensus process in, in which there's a committee that includes engineers, architects, um, building officials, uh, and, as well as um, members of the industry who, and, and, and people who construct buildings. And what it basically, it, by meeting ASC E24, you will meet the minimal requirements for the National Flood Insurance Program. ASC E24 also has some more specific language and some requirements that are above the National Flood Insurance Program, but it, it, it is at least as stringent as, NF, as, as the uh, Flood Insurance Program. Right now, what the residential code does is our, you know, our current language has um, prescriptive requirements. Uh, what we do is tell you what to do rather than refer to a reference standard which you then have to look at to find out what to do. So what we recommend is keeping the prescriptive language that's in the residential code which is as it's similar to ASC 24, it's as as stringent as ASC 24, but adding reference to ASC 24 to allow another option. By doing that, um, we would, you know, possibly as ASC 24 changes, um, that we would, you know, update the reference to new additions, and that may change the requirements. <coughs> Um, so our staff recommendation was to add reference to ASC 24 as a design option, but to also maintain the current prescriptive language, as is the practice for the residential code. The second proposal also from FEMA was to amend reference from ASC 24 
from the 2005 edition, which is the edition we looked at, and to reference instead the 2013 edition in the building code and in any new reference in the residential code. Um, we were not able to look at the 2013 edition because it's not available yet. Um, we asked ASCE and also ICC if we could see a copy and find out what the changes were, and it isn't available. ICC say, say they expect the 2015 ICC codes to refer to the 2013 edition of ASC 24, but um, they have not been able to review it yet. So we recommend considering updating to the 2013 edition after we've had a chance to look at it. Um, we should consider, you know, updating following an opportunity to review the changes. Our third recommendation is also based on the FEMA proposal. Um, they, that, that um, FEMA proposal was to amend the stru structural, within the structural chapter of the building code, chapter 16, to amend the language regarding flood construction and <coughs> flood areas. So section 1612 of the building code relates to construction in flood prone areas. And what FEMA recommends is adding um, requiring that the elevation requirements will be two feet above the 100-year flood elevation. Right now, the way the current language is, it's you have to be above the 100-year flood elevation, and that's the elevation, again, if you're familiar with the flood insurance program, the 100-year flood elevation is the, you know, the flood elevation, the design flood or the base flood elevation. So currently what we do is, is we require, um, well, we require that you design per ASCE 24, which allows a different, a, a few different um, sets of elevation requirements depending on the building use. What this FEMA change, and I'm sorry, I said that it, it re, I, I was incorrect when I said that we currently require that you're at that base flood elevation. Actually, there's a, there's a series of different elevation requirements, and this proposal would say that you're at least two feet above the base flood elevation or greater if required by ASC 24. Um, and we recommend adding this FEMA language so that would, um, with the clarification, and our clarification is that, that that we state that the elevation requirements are per ASC 24. Because um, current we don't discuss them in the building codes at this time. We just refer to, to ASC 24. And those elevation requirements are basically to say that your um, structural frame, the lowest part of your lowest structural frame, shall be above the design elevation that all your mechanical systems, electrical wiring, your electrical service entrance, all that kind of susceptible equipment or systems will be above um, this new elevation, two feet above the base flood elevation. Um, the fourth requirement was not from FEMA. This was, um, this was based on action from New York City. We looked at their, you know, some things that they've done that looked, looked pretty good. In this case, they're just requiring that in a floodplain area or a flood, flood prone area that healthcare facilities t take steps up front to ensure that they can provide electricity, um, heat, and air conditioning as needed. What, the, what we are recommending doing is sim similar to what New York City did is in, for all, all health care facilities, including hospitals, you'll either have a hookup for a temporary generator and an emergency plan showing how you're going to get that generator there, how you're going to hook it up in time to protect the, the, <coughs> the facility. And as an option, 
you could have a secondary power equipment that's above the design flood. So you either have the hookup, the emergency plan, access to a temporary generator, or you have a secondary source of power in case the primary source goes out. Hospitals, as in addition, hospitals. So that first one is for what it would include residential um, occupancies like assisted living facilities. Um, secondly, just for hospitals, they would also have to have boilers and chillers um, that might be essential to the health and safety of the people in the hospital that, that they would have to have either a, a secondary hookup or a secondary unit that's above the um, flood plain. So staff recommends adding those requirements to the to the uniform code. One possible place to put it is chapter four is special detailed requirements in a new section for healthcare facilities. The fifth requirement is again to look at looking at, at an action taken in New York City to require certain residential buildings to provide fixtures that would allow, provide potable water in a common area in the event that a, a critical water pump um, went out of service. So that happened during after Sandy, people in very tall residential apartment buildings had no access to water on the, on the higher floors. There was no public water access. So maybe an apartment in the lower floor might have water because it was the water mains had enough pressure to provide them. But in those taller apartment buildings, uh, a building pump would be needed to supply the upper apartments and those pumps were problems out for you operating. So people were without water in the upper floors of those apartment buildings and also, um, you know, there were other other issues that happened, but um, what New York City is, has done and what we recommend is adding this public water supply for every 100 occupants have one public water supply and add some provisions that would um, to provide emergency or standby power so that water in buildings over five stories in height, so at least you know, there'd be one public tap for every 100 occupants over that five story height. The sixth, the sixth recommendation is to, um, to add to the building code to require flood resistant materials in buildings below the design flood elevation plus that two foot um, pre-board that, that was part of the first recommendation. So what we recommend is adding reference to FEMA documents which describe the requirements for flood resistant materials and where to use them. Um, and that's the title of the documents is Flood Damage Resistant Material Requirements. Um, there's also another FEMA document regarding construction and floodgates and flood wells. We don't have any requirements, specific requirements in the building codes right now. And during uh, I, Sandy, there was identified a need for such, such standards. Another recommended, recommendation that came partly out of New York City was a, a recommendation to somehow provide some restriction for the potential to construct uh, H occupancy in a flood prone area. And H occupancy is an occupancy that involves um, storage or use of hazardous materials. And this, this, require, this uh, recommendation is not to necessarily prohibit all such occupancies, but to prohibit, um, to put some restrictions to protect public health. And I just want to mention that we did get a couple of proposals from FEMA that we did not recommend because we believe the existing language is more appropriate, enforceable, and in keeping with what we do in New York State. In both cases, the FEMA proposals, you know, were good proposals for recommendation, you know, for changes to the IRC, but New York State does think, has already made amendments. For instance, they um, we already have residential homes, a two foot free board. The free board is that two feet above the base flood elevation to the bottom of say the first floor elevation. 
And since New York State already requires it, our language was more restrictive than the New York than the, than the FEMA proposal. Um, FEMA the FEMA proposal also <coughs> did not want to allow any essential systems below the first floor elevation, even if you were <laughs> well above flood elevation. So for instance, if your first floor was five feet above the base flood, you still couldn't put any, any uh, electric wiring or um, say air conditioned lines below the house. And we recommended not, not um, adding that language, um, partly because um, it didn't, you know, it, it didn't seem to add as much safety as it added cost. The last FEMA proposal was to change the residential section that refers to manufactured ho housing to get rid of the current language that refers to specific requirements <coughs> and replace it with reference to a reference standard, ASC 24, and replace reference to designing per the building code with reference to ASC 24. <coughs> we recommend having the current language because it's more um, in keeping with providing prescript, sorry, prescriptive language within the residential code without the need to refer to a reference standard. And by going to the building code, you do get to <coughs> the LC24 since the building code has that requirement. And that's the, the sum of the proposals we do for resiliency in the built environment. <coughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Miriam. Uh, are there any questions from members of the council for Miriam on her report and uh, uh, the items contained in it? Any questions? Ron? Mr. Higby? Uh, just a technical question. In a number of instances, you're, you're talking about referencing a document. In some cases, it's ASCE 24 which is developed under a consensus process. In other cases, there are FEMA documents, some of which may not have been developed under a consensus process. Uh, does, this, does that present a problem in referencing them, or is there another vehicle for including them in the code? If you're, if you're asking me, I would say many of our standards are are developed through the consensus process is required by ANSI. We already have many references to federal documents in the building code. And you're correct, the federal documents are not are not developed through a consensus process. Um, but we we currently refer to um, different, uh, you know, the D some DOT standards, um, some other federal documents. So it isn't. <coughs> It isn't, um, you, you know, it's not a new precedent, setting precedent to refer to a federal standard, but it is not a consensus standard. Oh, thank you. Mayor Kennedy. Um, as we move forward with, with these standards, um, which ones, I mean, I'd like to know how it's going to be rolled out because you're obviously you already have buildings built. So now how do, how do we take care of for instance, hospitals and so forth. Uh, what kind of a plan have we got or have we laid out for them to meet, for instance, the, the backup electricity plan, the generator plan, and putting things at, at the right level now and so forth on buildings that are already built versus new construction? I understand new construction would be fairly simple and straightforward, but what about when these buildings are already built? Miriam, I don't know if you have anything that you'd like to add, but my, I would I would suggest that, that provisions that the Code Council might consider uh, implementing through the Uniform Code would be prospective, that they would apply to new construction or buildings that were substantially damaged and had to be improved uh, that, that triggered uh, certain requirements in the existing building code. So, just retroactively applying to uh, existing facilities that would not be within the, the purview of the of the uniform code. 
2B may be something that the state might want to require of a hospital, for instance, in the next two years, not in the code, but in some other way, is what you're saying? The initiative that she's got written down for item four, she refers to it as new and substantially improved health care facilities. So I don't think the intent was to be retroactive at all. Additional questions, Mr. Alteri? On that same note, item number five, regarding the potable water, the way it's worded, it could be construed as being retroactive. I'll just read the one sentence. The requirement would apply to both new construction and existing residential buildings greater than five stories in height. So that may need to be looked into. I did not, could I say, I didn't say that staff, our recommendations was without applying the requirements retroactively to existing buildings. It's in the memo, and I did not mention that. I should have. Mr. Flanagan? You've got the 50% rule on damage and building, what you're going to do. So that could be put into this committee. Additional questions? Okay. Ron? Is there a question? Yeah, Joe Sauerwein. Mr. Sauerwein, I can't see your hand. I can see one hand, but I can't see the one that's up. Oh, okay. How's that hand? There we go. Okay. Mr. Sauerwein. Regarding item four on page two, 4A actually, at the very end, for specific small facilities, the temporary power would be for emergency lighting, fire alarm systems, and sometimes an elevator. I'd suggest, and maybe this is actually in what is proposed, but I'd suggest fire alarm systems be changed to fire protection systems to cover those cases where perhaps a sprinkler is provided and it needs some power for a pump or something. And the other thing is heat and air conditioning. Depending on the time of the year, we may have to actually provide for heat and air conditioning in those facilities to keep, even if they're small, even if it's just one or two people who are affected by it, I think that's something that should be considered. And again, that may be included in the actual proposal, but I did not read it in this summary. Mr. Higbee? Yes. The trigger for all these requirements is the flood, the coastal flood plain. And it's my understanding that the flood maps are still in a state of flux. And I can't think of any more FL, words that begin with FL to add to that sentence, but I think you understand what I'm asking about. Are these maps still in flux? And if they are, is there any idea of when flood plain will be resolved in many areas of the state? Miriam, can you, is that something you can answer? I can answer that they have revised flood plains in response to the flood plain maps in response to Sandy, Irene, and Lee. And they're, I mean, they do, they are in a continual state of revision. They aren't a static map. However, you know, I think when you get your building permit, it would relate to the current flood, the map at the time during the building permit. So the requirements would apply based on what the map says when you're building your new construction. Just if I can ask one question to follow up on that. Where there have been revisions relative to Sandy, Lee, and the other storms, have these revisions mitigated map conditions in some communities or made them more stringent? In the communities that I'm aware of, which honestly tend to just be the ones impacted by Irene and Lee, the maps have been revised to show a larger flood plain, to show the flood plain going out further from the 
water body. Um, so something that used to be, say, 500-year flood plain is now in the 100-year flood plain. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, additional questions, and I apologize to our members in New York and Buffalo, but unfortunately our cameras can't seem to capture everyone. Uh, so if you if you're raising your hand and I'm not recognizing you, please uh, speak up. Okay, see no additional questions. Uh, we'll move on to uh, agenda item number six. Uh, this is the proposed rulemakings for the Uniform Code, the Energy Code. Uh, we have we are faced with a dilemma, uh, and I I need to present this to you, and uh, and and present a recommendation for your consideration. Uh, as as Mark mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, uh, beginning about uh, three or four days ago, uh, or I guess five days ago now, we began receiving a significant number of emails and information. Uh, related to uh, two issues of the Uniform Code update, and uh, and in those in those literally hundreds of emails were several uh, significant documents with information, data, uh, and uh, and and new information that the Code Council uh, was receiving for just the first time, and. As of yesterday, from yesterday afternoon, as Mark mentioned, there are a hundred other correspondences that we have received that you have not even been given. <coughs> so you don't you, you don't have the benefit of, of what might be contained in, in those emails. We also had uh, public comments that were presented this morning, uh, and uh, we appreciate the comments that everyone. Uh, presented, we appreciated everyone coming in and presenting uh, that information. But I, 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 I know I marked down a number of documents. Uh, there were fire studies or uh, reports that were referenced in one of the uh, in some of the comments. There was a cost estimating spreadsheet that was uh, that was referenced in uh, one of the comments. Uh, there was a there was a document, uh, two documents that were handed out to you this morning that contained uh, uh, a number of statistics and data, uh, and a, and another uh, report regarding fire fatalities, uh, all of which you have not looked at, have not reviewed, have not considered, nor has that been considered by the codes division and the staff that is responsible or presenting to you a complete body of work so that you can make informed decisions. Uh, in, in my mind, that leaves a significant number of unanswered questions. Uh, and and, and we, we, because of that, we are not prepared to present to you recommendation regarding agenda item number six. We don't feel you have a complete body of work at this point, unfortunately, and so we're, we're we are we are faced with a situation where <coughs> we, have, we don't feel that we have we have given you the the information, the tools that you need to make the right decision at this point. These are very important decisions. We understand that. That's that's a uh, that's certainly witnessed by the fact that uh, that we have many people that spoke this morning. Many people have uh, uh, very strong opinions regarding this update and, uh, and the provisions that are contained in, and, and that's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, the, the problem that we're facing is we don't feel we're prepared to, to discuss the, and, and, and decide on, on such an important issue with, with, without a complete body of information. And therefore, I, I'm faced with a, with a situation where I, I must recommend to you uh, that we that we postpone uh, discussion on on the uniform code update at this point. As as much as I regret having to say that, I feel it's absolutely necessary that uh, that we that we analyze this uh, new information that we've received and present it to you in a complete and coordinated fashion. And so 
Uh, in order to do that, I'm, I'm going to ask for uh, I'm going to ask for a motion from a member of the council to uh, postpone uh, agenda item number six and the discussion and any decisions that would be contained into it to a future meeting. I'm just talking about the number of people didn't even open last night. I would take that. Okay. There's a motion by uh, Mr. Flanagan. Is there a second to the motion? The second uh, by Mr. Altieri. Uh, I'll take discussion on the motion. Discussion? On. Uh, Mr. Mr. Sauerwein. Ron, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, uh, I uh, I believe in the figures, the actual figures and the facts of the matter. And I, there have been so many facts uh, presented. At, and, and I think we should have all of the factual material so that we can all make uh, the best decision for all of us. So I think we really would be doing a total disservice if we were to rush this matter at this point. So I think you have um, summarized exactly what the best action of the council should be. Mayor Kennedy. Um, and, I, and I agree that uh, we need to look at the facts. I also think we have had some uh, other facts that haven't been presented and uh, some additional information. And what I would like to have uh, as additional information is to understand in uh, the number of houses that we, that, you know, they talked about the number of houses that have gone down. How many of those are um, uh, an older vintage? Because a lot of our older houses caused a lot of the problem. And, and versus new construction, back and forth on that. And then when I'm thinking about maintenance, I would like to understand better uh, what maintenance would be on a fire sprinkler system because I, I think about um, homeowners right now that, that don't, uh, they have a hard time maintaining a smoke alarm with a, fire, with a battery in it. And, and so what would, uh, what would uh, that look like in terms of just uh, a maintenance problem with homeowners that don't understand complicated situations and then one of the pieces of information I'd really like to understand with so many people that are on pumps and wells and uh, throughout our various towns, what kind of a, a solution would be there? Because I, having installed a few of these things myself in another lifetime, uh, uh, making sure that um, the little fine gravel and sand and stuff gets into these sprinkler systems. It causes us all kinds of uh, trouble in terms of them working effectively. So I'd like to understand some more information about this whole maintenance problem that homeowners would essentially inherit uh, over time. I understand in a townhouse you've got a maintenance, a property maintenance person that's or, you know company or somebody that makes sense. But individual homeowners, I I see this. Problem that, that I don't see a good solution for. So, somebody get some information about that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, additional discussion on the motion, Mr. Altieri. Well, if I could add one more item to the list. Uh, I, I haven't heard what a typical cost would be from the municipal water main to the house. We keep hearing about the house and square footage, but you have to add that additional cost to the uh, cost of sprinkling the house. So, I'd like to see some average examples in, in different types of municipalities as to what that cost would be. Thank you. Additional discussion, Chief Batter? Um, this is probably more a procedural thing as we move forward with this. I would, I would defer to you to the, the staff. Um, you know, the, the reason we're in is it's not a bad predicament to be in, it's just a predicament. You know, we got bombarded in, in, over the space of five days with a, whatever the number was. And there was information buried in here, and we all admit that. As we, as, as the staff prepares to, to, you know, brief us going forward, the council going forward, is there, a, like, can you, I guess this is in the rules of the, the, the operation, is, can, is there a drop dead date? Say, look, we're not going to take any more after this point. We need to be able to, you know, 
digest what we have, give everybody fair notice that, you know, March 15th or, yeah, I like the Ides of March, but um, <laughs> is the cutoff day. To, to get your stuff in. We're going to dig down on it, you know, plenty of time, whatever that, or re, what the reason, whatever the reasonable person standard would be for that. So, you, you know, the staff can actually sit and go through it and so that the members of the, the council have a chance to peruse some of it. I mean, like you said, hey, there's there's hundreds of them that all say the same thing. It doesn't matter which side it was, you know, you know, here's my group's email blast and here's your group's email blast and buried in there, there's, there's nuggets someplace that might change somebody's opinion one way or the other. And you can't keep doing this up to, uh, you know, nine o'clock the night before and go like we do because it's just not fair at that point. Oh, we, will, we will study the, the issue and certainly within the, within the context of the rules and procedures that we have to follow, uh, we, will, we will address this situation uh, so, that, so that when we, when we get to the point of discussing this, everyone has a clean, the table is, the table is filled we have a clean slate, and we can discuss from a point that, that I think makes sense. So it's a, it's a very good point. Thank you. Uh, additional discussion on the motion. Seeing none, we'll take a, a voice vote on the motion. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? OK. Motions carried. Agenda item. <laughs> Number six will be postponed to a future meeting. Thank you. Agenda item number seven, next commercial energy code adoption update. This is a, this is a rulemaking that you have already uh, provided conceptual approval to the code council. We're simply giving you a, uh, a brief update on uh, the progress of, of this particular rulemaking. Mark, would you like to introduce? Yeah, uh, agenda, agenda item seven, uh, new commercial energy code adoption update. Uh, we have uh, Joe Hill, uh, assistant director for the energy, energy unit in the codes division. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Just a very short note on the commercial energy code update, which is now completed. Uh, since our last meeting in December, we have already shared with you an issue of parity between the two codes, the IPCC 2012, on which our commercial energy code is based, and ASHRAE 90.1 2010. There was an issue of parity, but that's been ironed out. And I think that was addressed in a prior memo that I sent to you all. So, Mark. But as you know, cost payback is also an issue that is uh, an issue uh, that is required by uh, Article 11, Energy Law of New York State, and also required by our SAPA documents. SAPA documents require us to show continuing cost compliance with the requirements of the Energy Code. Article 11 requires us to indicate that the new code, in the new code, a cost of materials and their installation the amended energy standard would be equal or less than the present value of energy savings that could be expected in these buildings within 10 years. The U.S. Department of Energy has provided all states with an energy cost analysis of energy performance of commercial buildings. And they do this in an effort to assist states in adopting the newer codes, the updated codes. They do an energy analysis, and they also do a cost analysis. Now, we've utilized that report in our SAPA documents, and unfortunately, our review had indicated that we had, uh, or the U.S. Department of Energy uh, report indicated some anomalies. So, one of our technical subcommittee members, Mr. Ian Graham, who I'd like to take this time to thank for uh, continued support of uh, working with DOE directly to amend this report. Ian put in a, a tremendous amount of hours and effort to amend the U.S. Department of Energy report and also to put those findings 
in a manner that we could include in our SEPA documents. Fortunately, U.S. Department of Energy agreed to amend their report, and in mid-December we received that amended report. We amended our SEPA documents, and Mr. Ball is now in receipt of the entire package, and meaning our Office of Counsel is in receipt of our entire commercial energy package, and in our estimation, we are complete. We have yet to hear back from Office of Counsel on this, but we assume that we are now complete with the Energy Conservation Construction Code for commercial buildings. Any questions, please? Any questions for Joe? Thank you for your update. Thank you, sir. Agenda item number eight, more restrictive local standards. Mr. Bill Adjusters, Village of Freeport, Mr. Bill Adjusters, Village of Freeport, Local Law 1, Local Law 2, Local Law 3, Local Law 4, Local Law 5, Local Law 6, Local Law 7, Local Law 8, Local Law 9, Local Law 10, Local Law 11, Local Law 12, Local Law 13, Local Law 14, Local Law 15, Local Law 16, Local Law 17, Local Law 18, Local Law 19, Local Law 20, Local Law 21, Local Law 22, Local Law 23, Local Law 24, Local Law 25, Local Law 26, Local Law 27, Local Law 28, Local Law 29, Local Law 30, Local Law 31, Local Law 32, Local Law 33, Local Law 34, Local Law 35, Local Law 36, Local Law 37, Local Law 38, Local Law 39, Local Law 40, Local Law 41, Local Law 42, Local Law 43, Local Law 44, Local Law 45, Local Law 46, Local Law 47, Local Law 48, Local Law 49, Local Law 50, Local Law 51, Local Law 52, Local Law 53, Local Law 54, Local Law 55, Local Law 56, Local Law 57, Local Law 58, Local Law 59, Local Law 60, Local Law 61, Local Law 62, Local Law 63, Local Law 64, Local Law 65, Local Law 66, Local Law 67, Local Law 68, Local Law 69, Local Law 70, Local Law 71, Local Law 72, Local Law 73, Local Law 74, Local Law 75, Local Law 76, Local Law 77, Local Law 78, Local Law 79, Local Law 80, Local Law 81, Local Law 82, Local Law 83, Local Law 84, Local Law 85, Local Law 86, Local Law 87, Local Law 88, Local Law 89, Local Law 90, Local Law 91, Local Law 92, Local Law 93, Local Law 94, Local Law 95, Local Law 96, Local Law 97, Local Law 98, Local Law 99, Local Law 100, Local Law 101, Local Law 102, Local Law 103, Local Law 104, Local Law 105, Local Law 106, Local Law 107, Local Law 108, Local Law 109, Local Law 110, Local Law 111, Local Law 112, Local Law 113, Local Law 114, Local Law 115, Local Law 116, Local Law 117, Local Law 118, Local Law 119, Local Law 120, Local Law 121, Local Law 122, Local Law 123, Local Law 124, Local Law 125, Local Law 126, Local Law 127, Local Law 128, Local Law 129, Local Law 130, Local Law 131, Local Law 132, Local Law 133, Local Law 134, Local Law 135, Local Law 136, Local Law 137, Local Law 138, Local Law 139, Local Law 140, Local Law 141, Local Law 142, Local Law 143, Local Law 144, Local Law 145, Local Law 146, Local Law 147, Local Law 148, Local Law 149, Local Law 150, 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 Local Law 
code stand now? Uh, any substantial damage uh, properties, properties that have been determined to be 50% damaged, um, must comply with the new existing codes. The codes, the way that they stand now, is two foot free board requirement. Um, we did have 23 properties that were elevated in the past, which were at the two foot above. Those properties were also slightly affected because the storm surge surpassed that. The total storm surge for the village of Freeport equaled 10.12. Um, we are seeking um, to accomplish a few different goals, not only by, of course, first and foremost, protecting the safety of the residents, the, the property and the possessions, um, but we are also concerned about the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act, which was uh, initiated in July of 2012, which allows for flood insurance premiums to increase, um, which are greatly affecting the residents now. A resident who in the past was paying $2,000 in flood insurance are now receiving quotes of $12,000. Um, the construction for any new construction or substantial damaged properties, if they do and if they do approve um, the elevation to the minimum of four feet above, that will reduce a $12,000 premium to $400 for a resident. That will, of course, help with the resiliency of our community, um, ensuring that people can stay and can afford to stay residents of the Village of Freeport. Um, also, uh, the Village of Freeport, uh, through the National Flood Insurance Program, is a CRS community, a community rated system. We are a Rate is presently a seven, which allows for the residents of the village of Freeport to receive a 15% discount in their flood insurance premiums. Amending this ordinance to be more restrictive uh, will push us towards being rated a six, which will then in turn allow for the residents of the village of Freeport to receive a 20% discount on their flood insurance premiums. So basically, our main concern is the safety and, of course, to make sure that. The village of people remains resilient and remains a community. Thank you. If I may just add, may have one more uh, one more item. This um, village code was also subject of a public hearing within the village of Freeport and prior to passing passing on our level, and there was no opposition. People uh, of the community came out in favor of this. Uh, before, and thank you for your presentation, before you uh, sit down, I'd like to ask if members of the council have any questions for the representatives from the village of Freeport. Mayor Kennedy. Uh, so your your new ordinance, is it now in um, uh, compliance or above compliance with the new FEMA requirements that we were just talking about a minute ago because they are raising the standard. And so your four feet would now put it at the right? That is correct. The flood insurance rate maps, which are, of course, uh, where insurance companies uh, generate information as to what, what to charge a resident for the policies. The Most of the village of Freeport is a base flood elevation of an eight. There are very few sections of Freeport that are a nine, and very, very little sections of Freeport that are a ten. If during Sandy, if you were complying with the federal standard of being an ace, you would have had two and a half feet of water by being compliant with federal standard. The uh, village of Freeport's ordinance now as it stands is two <coughs> feet above, which is also the state free board requirement. We would like to see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, I'm, I'm even more confused, I guess, right now. I guess kind of following on to the mayor's uh, question. We just had an extensive presentation on the resiliency and assuming that we ultimately get a day when we can move forward and adopt that into the IR, into the New York Residential Code, how will that relate to uh, potential action we take here on your more restrictive local standard? Will you still be more restrictive than what will become base state? Yes, absolutely. And that is the purpose and wording of the of the uh, proposed change would be that the village of people would be four feet above the federal standard uh, or actually two feet above the state mandated standard, whichever is greater. Um, that way if the state ever decides to increase their code or the federal decides to change the flood maps, the village of Freeport will still be and remain proactive. Thank you. Thank you. Answer your question? Yes, thank okay. you. Additional questions?
seeing no additional questions, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, members of the council, we have a petition from the village of Freeport. Uh, let's open up for discussion and a motion. Well, I have a motion that we uh, uh, allow, allow these rest new restrictive standards. Uh, it seems that they are villages in support of that, and it seems to me that uh, we're trying to go with how we protect their homes along the uh, motion by Mayor Kennedy is second by Mr. Flanagan for approval of the more restrictive local standards. Let's take discussion on the motion. Discussion. Mr. Sauerwein. Uh, Mr. Peaster, if we look at the summary on page four, I can't recall a single request for a more restrictive local standard that met every single uh, item as specified in the regulations for us to consider such a, um, uh, a request. Uh, that coupled with their, I, I believe it was 150 pages or, or, or whatever of on the <laughs> documents, including, including public their public hearings and the comments and so forth, uh, I think uh, that this is a MRLS that we certainly should properly approve. Thank you. Additional discussion? So would you like to make a statement? If you don't mind, I, I, may I suggest that the motion be amended to include the findings as requested the code council find that the more restrictive local standard is reasonably necessary because of special conditions within the village. Standards conform with accepted engineering and fire prevention practices and that the uh, standards uh, or furtherance of the general principles of Article 18 of the executive law. You said it very well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have your training. Mayor, we knew you meant to say that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, additional discussion on the uh, on the uh, motion. Seeing none. Take a voice vote. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, and I, I would like Mr. Sauerwein uh, made a comment uh, to the representative from the village. Uh, thank you for making a complete and comprehensive uh, submission and petition to the Code Council. You made you made the code council uh, work easy on this one, so congratulations. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for much. your good work. Much. Okay, uh, agenda item number nine, future meetings. Mark, would you like to give us just a quick summary of our future meetings? Just very briefly, right now the uh, um, schedule of the code council meeting this year, 2014. The next one will be, uh, is currently scheduled for May 7th. After that, August 20th. And the last one scheduled right now is for November 18th. Okay. Thank you. Any uh, any questions for Mark on that? Seeing none, we'll move to agenda item number 10, other business. Before I ask if there's any other business uh, that members of the council would like to bring, uh, I mentioned that, uh, that I would like to ask uh, the council to provide to discuss and uh, and provide some direction to staff uh, on the uh, on the issue that was discussed during the public comment period uh, earlier this morning regarding uh, fire portable fire extinguisher monitoring systems. You've uh, you've received some information uh, at last year. You received some information. You've received some public comments uh, and uh, and today uh, additional information. Uh, by the speakers, and uh, uh, we are we are prepared to uh, to begin doing some work on this. We'd like to get some direction from the council regarding your thoughts on uh, on how staff should proceed in in developing some uh, some work for your consideration. Any uh, any direction or discussion that the council would like to undertake at this time? Chief Martin. Um, yeah, I, I've got a couple comments. Uh, that I'd like to make. I noticed uh, from the technical aspect, when it's dealing with B occupancies, it's only going to be a trigger 
when the, the B occupancy is three stories and above, yet in an S2 storage of moderate hazard, it's 10,000 square feet or larger. Um, and and uh, my real concern, um, I think most of the folks on the council know that I've got a vested interest in, in college buildings, and college buildings fall into that B occupancy. And I could have a one-story college building with general chemistry labs and, and other teaching labs uh, that would certainly be a concern to me that, that fire extinguishers be available and immediately serviceable uh, in the event of a fire in a lab. And yet, if it's a one or two story building, this isn't going to kick in. So we should consider that um, so as we continue to deliberate. Mayor Kennedy? So when you're saying that, that would that cover <clears throat> all one or two story buildings, or would that cover three above and with the uh, uh, exception or a special uh, dispensation for uh, a building that had highly flammable, like a chemistry lab, those kinds of things, because I start looking at all one and two story buildings and what does that really mean and what does that really cost? I'm thinking about your, what you say that that one behind the door was not, not compliant according to what so what does that mean when we're talking about doing this? And, and I, I actually don't understand the technology that they're talking about, that they're going to monitor fire extinguishers. How does that actually happen? I'm curious. Well, that's a, it. It sounds like that may be a question that you'd like to have answered. It really okay. is, because I'm, I'm trying to understand what, what does this mean to everybody in terms of how does this get actually implemented because that's usually where the, where the rub really comes you know wh wh what's going to happen here this is this is the kind of information that will be helpful to us as we as we develop uh, some some information for your consideration uh, are there additional questions or any other any other comments that members of the council would like to make, Mr. Altieri? Maybe some examples of other states that have already implemented this uh, requirement, just to see what they're doing and what their triggers are as far as occupancy, number of stories, and so on. Okay. Yeah. Also, Mr. How does the system work? Okay. Uh, additional. Comments, suggestions, yeah. Mr. Sauerwein. I'll defer to Mr. Higby first. Uh, are you on the other business or just still on this issue? Uh, uh, we're still on this issue. Okay, mine is other business. I'd, okay, Mr. Sauerwein. Just, uh, in line with uh, uh, Mayor Kennedy, I think um, uh, several other comments. I, I'd be interested. Well, I have some idea of how it, uh, some of the technology behind it. I'd be interested in in um, this movement of the extinguisher and reporting that the extinguisher was moved out of place. Um, some of the comments this morning, the public comments were that uh, if extinguishers were used, like as in to ex extinguish a fire in the incipient stages, right now nobody knows that, but uh, with the technology, a signal would be sent someplace. Uh, and that's fine as long as the custodian who picks it up to dust it off doesn't initiate somehow an alarm to the fire department. By the same token, if somebody does use it uh, to extinguish a fire, uh, we don't want it going to a central station who, when they get around to it, will notify somebody who maybe lives five or ten miles or minutes away and uh, Th those are the type of specifics I think we really have to gather uh, or get get gathered for so we can consider the um, the merits of the system. Mayor Kennedy, and I, I'd just like to make one more comment, and it comes it comes from a, another background, which is a technology background. Some of you may know that um, I worked for Hewlett Packard for many years, and and uh, new technology that comes out. I, I, I never was a proponent to adopt new technology the minute it came out. It's usually buggy. It's usually got issues. Things haven't been worked out. And the early adopters end up being the ones who pay a high price for that. 
So I want to make sure that just because we got a new technology, we don't all jump on a bandwagon. We haven't really got got clear understanding of what this is and how it works and what's the cost and the impact and etc. Additional comments. Okay, we'll uh, we'll take this information. Thank you for your for your input. We'll take this information. Uh, we, we will uh, consult with the proponents of uh, of the proposal, and uh, and then we'll present a uh, we'll present a report to you uh, at a future meeting, probably our next meeting. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. And uh, now we're on to uh, other 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 business. Uh, Mr. Higby, you had a uh, you had an item you'd like to present. Uh, yes. Uh, earlier today, we heard some comments regarding high-efficiency toilets, uh, specifically from from Larry, Larry Levine, NRDC, who said that this issue had been uh, vetted by a technical committee there at the Department of State, and that there was no objection to using high-efficiency toilets in uh, residential occupancies. Uh, since there was an objection to commercial, this recommendation never made it to the uh, uh, to the revisions to the uh, residential code. Uh, he also said that the uh, these were commonly available. In fact, apparently more available than other uh, water flow uh, toilets, and therefore had no uh, price differential. As a result of his remarks, uh, I'm wondering, can this provision be incorporated into the code that's now before us or added at least to the next uh, cycle of uh, updates to the residential code that that is that was one of the issues that sort of fell into this big pot of uh, of unanswered questions that, that we were faced with uh, with respect to the uniform code update we will we'll research that and we'll include that uh, when we when we have our discussion on the update at, at, our, at a future meeting. Does that satisfy your uh, Yes, I'm, I'm, curi I'm curious. We're talking about updates to the current code that's before us, not just this issue, but the, uh, the issue about fire extinguisher monitoring. Or are we saying that this, uh, these are not eligible for the current uh, residential code update, but would be part of a subsequent future update we will will evaluate the, that issue as well as some of these other issues and we'll uh, we will will present our recommendations to you in a in a complete form uh, in the future and frankly I, I don't know and I think we would probably be guessing if we said we'll include it in the next update or we need to push it to the next cycle but we'll certainly evaluate and if it's if it makes sense to include as part of the proposal, to update the code and you know in our next code update then we will certainly do that yeah and just to be clear I wasn't pressing for including it I just didn't want to upset the uh, the process that we currently have this code undergoing and delay it further by adding uh, any additional requirements at the moment no, we appreciate that thank you Mayor Kennedy, when, when you're when you're evaluating it, would you also? Con, uh, I'm not sure whether we're talking about this just in new construction, because I happen to live in a house that's 125 years old and has a very long sewer line from one end to the other. <laughs> and one of the problems happens to be enough water to clear that sewer line. So I think about. I'm always thinking about exceptions to rules, and when somebody makes these mandates. They don't think about those exceptions to rules and how that gets handled and what we're going to do with it. So I just would, again, say when during that evaluation, how do these things get, get um, considered? Because it happens in single family houses a lot, especially the older ones that have some of these things that I happen to know about. It's an excellent point. We'll make sure to include that. Uh, any other business for today? Mr. Sarwan, I see your hand again. Uh, yes. Sorry to take so much time, but as most of you probably recall, uh, recently there was a tragic death due to a CO-related uh, problem on Long Island. 
Um, the offshoot of that is um, there are many municipalities, according to the papers, there are many municipalities that are on Long Island, at least, that are considering um, requiring carbon monoxide detection in, quote, commercial, unquote, buildings. Uh, I've been approached by representatives from two separate municipalities uh, asking some basic questions, and I said, well, you're responsible for your elected officials who are responsible to the, the uh, electorate. I said they will do what they think is right to make it safe for their citizens. I said, but don't forget, I'm not going to tell you not to do not to do a local requirement and um, wait for the state to do anything, but uh, just remember to send it to the code council and it will be approved or not approved and maybe all of this stuff will trigger some type of uh, discussion uh, for a statewide uh, proposal. So uh, two things I have for you. Number one, uh, is there any discussion that you know of, Mr. Peaster, about any modifications to the carbon monoxide detection requirements right now? And uh, number two is just be aware uh, you'll probably be getting a slew of um, MRLS uh, requests. Uh, to answer your uh, your first question, uh, there is no discussion that is taking place uh, internally with staff. Nothing has been presented to the code council. We will we will certainly monitor the investigation into this tragedy, uh, and when when the uh, when the facts of uh, of what actually happened. Are known and and there is there is information and data that that uh, that would be instructive to the code council for discussion. We will certainly present that to you. But at this point, our understanding is that there there is investigation taking place, uh, and we'll be we'll be waiting on on the conclusion of that investigation. Chief Martin, you had a you had a comment uh, regarding some some other issues. Uh, just on a related note. I in the last uh, 24 hours become not aware of at least two bills in the legislature that may ultimately provide some direction to the council on this should they make it through the legislative process too. Okay. Does that answer your question, Mr. Sauerwein? Yes, it does. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. I just raised the point that maybe they could come under the fire protection system for fire and smoke. Just can't just do that. But that's, you know, that could be looked into too. That would be a quicker way to do it. Well, and that, that will, you know, at, at some point, we'll, these are the types of issues we may find ourselves discussing. Absolutely. Okay, Chief Batter. In my other career, I was, a, was aware of several other commercial occupancy type, uh, commercial occupancy carbon monoxide incidents. Um, However, this shakes out. I, I think perhaps maybe it is time that it gets addressed. Um, you know, it usually takes it usually takes a human sacrifice now and then to move things along. Um, the incidents that I know about, they were just a little, you know, somebody had to go to the hospital, blah blah blah, or a bunch of people. Um, but uh, you know, as everybody said, you know, this might move. Real relatively quickly, you know, through the, uh, the legislature. And uh, we can figure out where to, st you know, as John said, we can figure out where to put it appropriately going forward at that point. But uh, I think it may very well be the time to do that because of the nature of the HVAC systems and such. And again, we will we'll continue to monitor this. And uh, we'll present information to you once we have uh, the results of uh, the studies that are oh, ongoing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, additional, any other business uh, before the council today? Mark, you have a you have an item you'd like to present? Uh, just three items, very briefly. The first one is um, for anyone here that's uh, to receive their continuing education credits, uh, they need to sign up and see um, Michael Auerbach right there to do so um, before the meeting is over. Um, the other item is just an update, a quick update. At the last December meeting of the Code Council, the um, 
the co council considered the the department of environmental conservation draft petroleum bulk storage regulations and gave guidance to the to DEC as to whether their draft regulations might be in conflict with the uniform code and I just want to let you know that the they have been advised of the code council's decision and part of that was for more time to allow the division of building standards and codes to do another more comprehensive review on those that comparison between the regulations and the uniform code we did that I had a separate person did that a mirroring MacGyver in fact and she did not have any additional items to report and that has been reported to DEC as well the last item is also at the last meeting the code council considered a more restrictive local standard from the village of Hastings on Hudson they gave approval for that more restrictive local standard that was actually was for the energy code the the local law included many green code provisions and at that time we were aware of at least one uniform code issue that was not approved by the code council and it became quite complicated and the code council asked that the code division provide the village some of some guidance as to what that decision might mean to help them decipher that they even advise of that as well of that decision and we have offered our help in and making some of those determinations of what else is on in that local law because it's quite lengthy the village has responded they they reviewed their local law again they believe they only have that one uniform code issue and that there aren't any more that was the one about the water consumption I think it was for urinals that they had in there that was more restrictive than the in the uniform code and we have not responded to that yet we still have to in which case we will look at their their local law again to make sure to help determine whether there might be any additional items when we last looked at it we believe that was also the only item that was in conflict with the uniform code but we're going to have a second look at that and report back to them thank you any other business seeing none thanks for your service today I will entertain a motion to adjourn we are adjourned thank you very much